Hi, I'm Ray Dean. Welcome to Life Sciences. Today we're going to look at theories of evolution. Have you ever wondered how snakes lost their legs? So let's have a look and see if we can find out why. Okay, according to one of the theorists, uh, Lamarck, he says that snakes were lizard-like creatures, so like this one here, um, and as they went into burrows, um, they used their legs because they used to wiggle in the narrow burrow. And that is how they didn't use their legs, so they lost, lost the actual use of or the, the, the limbs. All right, so let's have a look at the concepts or the, the um, aspects that we're going to um, cover in this topic. So in the theories of evolution, we're going to have a look at Lamarckism. So he was one of the theorists. We're going to look at Darwinism, which is also from Darwin. Um, we're going to have a look at punctuated equilibrium. And then we're going to have a look at artificial selection. All right. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the key words. The first one is artificial selection. And that's, if we have a look at the terminology there, artificial means that we artificially select something. Um, so, in other words, it's not happening naturally. Okay, so this is where humans selectively breed. So, we, so that selective breeding of organisms to produce domesticated animals and even um, plants with more desirable traits. Okay, so it's basically... Um, humans selecting um, certain characteristics that then satisfy their own needs. Okay. Right, then natural selection, which is now the opposite, um, is the process whereby organisms better adapted to the environment tend to survive and then produce more offspring. So in other words, there it's nature selecting the characteristics and that then allows the organisms to survive. All right, and then uh, another theory that we're going to have a look at um, is punctuated equilibrium. Actually, it's a hypothesis that um, evolutionary development is marked by isolated episodes of rapid speciation between long periods of little or no change. And this is where the term punctuated comes from. So if we have a look there, punctuated means that there's breaks in between, and equilibrium means balance or equal. So in other words, during long periods of time, there might be a change, a sudden change, and you get speciation happening. Okay, so basically what punctuated equilibrium is that is long periods of time where we have, uh, that are punctuated or broken by shorter periods where rapid change occurs, and that's where we see um, organisms changing. All right, and then um, we're going to also have a look at Lamarckism. And Lamarckism is, is um, named after Lamarck. Um, and he was a, a French theorist who, um, who, who worked uh, actually before the development of genetics. So what he, he basically used or his ideas came from what he saw. Okay, so what he believed is that organisms can pass on to the offspring physical characteristics um, that the parent organism acquires through their lifetime, okay, through their lifetime, either by using or disusing something. So if they use something, an organ or a structure, for example, the giraffes, um, if they stretch their necks, they would grow. If they don't, uh, and the snakes, how they lost their legs, and the fact that the snakes didn't use their, their legs uh, in their burrows, they then um, they disappeared. So that was disuse. And then basically that characteristic that was acquired during its lifetime, that organism would then pass on to its offspring. All right, and then the next one we're going to look at, the next concept is Darwinism, and that's named after Charles Darwin. Um, who was quite famous for 
um, his studies in the Galapagos Island and actually all around the world. He traveled around on a ship um, and he traveled all over the world um, making observations and he came up with a theory where species evolve or evolution takes place through what he called natural selection. So in other words, organisms were then um, selected by, there were things from the environment or selective pressures from the environment that ensured that whichever characteristic was the favorable one was then selected and those organisms then would survive. Okay, and that is through Charles Darwin. We've come to the end of this part of our lesson. We're going to take a short break. See you afterwards. Welcome back from the ad break. Let's get on with our lesson. Okay, so let's have a look. Now we're going to have a look at Lamarckism. So we're going to have a look at this aspect. Um, it's a theory that was proposed by a man called Lamarck. And he put forward two laws. The one is called the law of use and disuse. And the other one is called the law of inheritance of acquired characteristics. So now we're going to have a look at specifically... Um, at that segment. Alright, so let's have a look here. This is what we call a mind map. Um, it's a very nice study tool that you can use when you are studying to um, set out information. And if we have a look here, here we have our main concept is the theories of evolution. Um, and here we have the two main theorists that we are going to look at uh, is Darwin and Lamarck. And for now we're going to look specifically at the two aspects, uh, or da, uh, Lamarck's two laws, um, the law of use and disuse, and inheritance of acquired characteristics. Um, we'll look at later, we'll have a look at Darwin and his natural selection, as we've already said, and then we'll have a look at e uh, punctuated equilibrium. So we'll have a look at these two later. Okay. All right, so let's have a look at Lamarck's theory. So basically Lamarck um, worked in the 18th century and what he believed is that organisms that, so for example the giraffe here, all organisms were born exactly the same. They all looked exactly the same. They had the same characteristics. And what happened is during their lifetime, for example the giraffes, if we have a look here, here you can see a giraffe not like we know it today, but one that is eating with a short neck and is eating off the ground. Um, so he believed that all giraffes were born with short necks. And what happened is once the food on the ground ran out and they, um, there was competition from other organisms, they started to feed out of the trees. And by stretching up to the tree to reach the food there, the necks started to elongate. And the more they stretched, the longer the neck became. And when the neck became longer, um, they were able to reach higher up in the tree. And so the neck became even longer and they were able to reach even taller trees and even longer. And now they were able to reach very tall trees and basically eliminate any competition from other animals. Okay, so what... Um, and then this would happen in an organism's lifetime. So during its lifetime, the organism would actually, its neck would grow. Um, and then once it had grown, then it would select or decide to choose that um, characteristic and it would then um, pass that on to its offspring. So that the next generation of giraffes were born with long necks. Okay, and this was Lamarck's theory. Okay, so his two laws that he set forward or put forward was the law of use and disuse. So let's have a look at this one. So what he believed here is that if organs or structures were used, they would grow, develop. Then they would develop um, and become 
uh, whatever, stronger, longer, bigger, whatever. Um, and that then, they would then pass that on to their, their offspring. Um, the, the part of the disuse there, he believed that when organs were not used, so in other words, we didn't use, an organism didn't use those organs. So when organs or structures were not used, they disappeared. Okay, so this was Lamarck's theory. Okay, Lamarck's second law was known as the law of inheritance of acquired characteristics. So let's break that down. So basically what he's saying is that organisms inherit an acquired characteristic. And what does the word acquired mean? Acquired means that we um, get this or develop um, this characteristic um, during our lifetime, develop this in our lifetime. Okay, so his law then said that it's an it's an, a characteristic that is developed in the lifetime that is in that is inherited by the offspring of that organism that has developed or acquired that characteristic. Okay, let's look at Lamarck's laws in more detail. All right, so the first law, the law of use and disuse, what Lamarck suggested is that animals changed over time. Um, so that they could survive in a new environment. He also said that, uh, he, that if a structure was used more often, that structure then became bigger in the following generations. Okay, so um, for example, the, the long neck of the giraffe. So as the giraffe stretched to get to the leaves um, and they wanted to get to the nice brand new or young leaves at the top of the tree, they then stretch their necks and those then develop more and more and each generation the, the neck got longer and that was passed on to the offspring. Okay, similarly he said that if a structure was not being used then this structure, say if it was not used, then this structure would become smaller and might even disappear. Um, and that's we can have a look and see here in this diagram again. So if, what he believed is that snakes were lizard-like, so they looked a lot like a lizard with the four limbs, two forelimbs and two hind limbs. Um, and as they went and burrowed in the soil or lived under rocks or whatever, the space was very narrow, which then didn't allow them really to use those limbs. So those limbs were there, but they didn't use them. So the less they used the limbs, the smaller they became, until eventually the limbs completely disappeared. And this is how we know snakes today without any limbs. Okay. All right, now Lamarck's second law, the law of inheritance of acquired characteristic. So he also explained that organisms then, as I said earlier, once they had acquired or developed these characteristics, they then um, would pass these on to their offspring. So organisms in the next generation would inherit these changed structures from their parents. And that he called the law of acquired characteristics, inheritance of acquired characteristics. Okay, so basically, and if you think of anything today, so in other words, um, when you know these young, young people that go to the gym and they develop all these big muscles. So according to Lamarck, what would happen then is when those people then have children or have offspring, they would also be born very buff and <laughs> very muscly. Um, and that, you know, that is, was according to Lamarck's theory. All right. Um, so if you have a look here, he says that the characteristics developed during the life of an individual. Okay, so one individual would change the structure. 
or would change, their structure or their body structure would change because they used or they didn't use a an organ or a, a, a part of their body frequently. Um, and then that would be passed on to its offspring. So over a lifetime, the giraffe could develop an elongated neck, allowing it to get much more food. Um, there wouldn't be, there weren't any other organisms that were as tall as, as the giraffe, um, and they would not be able to reach the leaves. And you know, when a tree grows, the new, the lovely, um, crisp, fresh, um, delicious, juicy leaves are right at the top of the, of the tree. So this allowed the giraffe then to get to those leaves and there weren't any other animals that were able to um, feed off that. And those, um, that characteristic, so that long neck that was developed during the giraffe's lifetime, the parents could then pass this elongated neck to the offspring. Alright, so there we can see Okay, so initially he believed that all the giraffe were born with short necks, but as they used them over time in that lifetime, so the, the necks became much longer and they were then able to feed off much taller trees. And then there was no competition, so they were then able to survive. Okay, so why was Lamarck wrong? Why do we not accept his theory? Okay, so we know... Today, uh, we have the benefits of knowledge that has been developed um, after Lamarck uh, developed his theory about genetics. So Mendel worked long after um, Lamarck, and so we know that genetics um, is, you know, it involves genes which actually affect the phenotype. So it's not the phenotype, so the physical appearance cannot affect the genes. Um, it was the other way around. So if we have a look here, we, we know that organisms don't evolve because they are determined to change. That change happens um, randomly. So that, those changes take ra place randomly and they take place through mutations. So it's when the DNA replicates or when protein synthesis is taking place that these mutations occur. Because it's mutations that um, would affect a characteristic, those mutations and to be passed on to next generation must be when gametogenesis is taking place and not um, simply happening through a lifetime of an individual um, and they are then, it doesn't change the genetics. Okay, um, and if we have a look here, the acquired characteristics cannot be inherited. So if I develop strong muscles or I grow my hair or um, I chop off a finger or I lose a leg in an accident, that is not going to change my genotype. It has absolutely no effect on my genotype. Um, and it's my genotype that is already established when the sperm cell and egg cell uh, fused to form a zygote. That is where the genetics is, or the genotype of an organism is established. And it's that um, genotype that remains the same. There's no ways of changing your genotype. So even if I do acquire certain phenotypic changes or characteristics in my lifetime, I'm not going to be able to pass those on to my, uh, my offspring. They would then have to, um, it would have to, the, a change in the phenotype would have to take place through mutation. Okay, so, and scientists have tested this, um, this theory of Lamarck where they conducted investigations where they actually chopped off the tails of mice. And when they chopped off those tails, um, they allowed those mice then to breed. And when the offspring were born, they were all born with tails. So this is why we know that um, Lamarck's theory is not a, a plausible explanation of evolution. But we study Lamarck's theory so that we can understand how scientific knowledge has developed. So this is why we say it's, there's a hypothesis that can be tested or, or um, rejected, or we test it and it can either be accepted or rejected. And then that then builds onto a theory.
And so as new knowledge is developed, so we might change our ideas and our theories uh, that we might have uh, developed early on. And, um, and this is definitely what has taken place um, with Lamarck's theory. Okay, so let's have a look at what we've covered so far. So if we have a look at our theories of evolution, we've had a look at one of the theories, um, and that is Lamarckism. And we call it Lamarckism because it's, it was put forward by um, a, a theorist or a scientist called um, Jean Lamarck. Um, and his theory, basically, he had two laws. Okay, so remember that there were two laws for his theory. And the first one is the law of use and disuse. And that's where we, dis we um, learned that if an organ is used, it develops... And if it's not used, then it can disappear. It gets smaller, um, it becomes smaller, or it can even disappear. Okay, so that then is his law of use um, and disuse. All right, and then if we have a look at his second law, um, he said that the, the second law was that organisms would inherit an acquired characteristic. So in other words, um, parents would develop a characteristic or an individual so they developed a characteristic during their lifetime. And this characteristic that was inherited during their lifetime would then be passed on to their offspring. Okay, and we know that, uh, you know, characteristics can't be passed or phenotype cannot change genotype. So that is why we say that although um, his laws, he did put forward these laws that with more knowledge that we have acquired or we have learned or we have developed, that we now realize that his theory uh, is not accepted. So we actually reject his theory. Welcome back from the break. I hope you had time to stretch your legs and maybe get something to drink. Okay, so let's carry on and have a look at our next theorist um, that we're going to study is Darwin. And let's see about that one. Okay, so it's also one of the theory. It's also one of the theories of evolution. Um, and here specifically, we're now going to have a look at Darwin. And Darwin's theory, um, he, we call natural selection. So that already tells us um, that it's more uh, in the natural. So there's something, there's factors from the environment that would then affect it. So let's have a look. Okay, so his theory of evolution by natural selection was basically um, a, a concept that he developed um, based on observations that he made on his journey around um, the world. So what happened is, as a young man, he started studying medicine, and then he started. Then he didn't like that, so then he went on to study um, theology, and he didn't like that. So what happened is, and in those days. Um, the eldest son usually took over from the father, so he would inherit the land or whatever. And, and Darwin wasn't the eldest son, so he then um, joined um, an expedition 
or a, a journey on a ship called the HMS Beagle, and he traveled around the world. And while he on his travels, on the journey, and those journeys took very many months and sometimes years, um, he, they stopped at a lot of places along the way, and what he did is he, he observed, because he was interested in nature and in the natural environment, he started making notes, he started making observations, he did diagrams. And then from those um, observations and um, uh, interesting uh, things that he saw, he then um, put forward his theory. And we call it the theory of natural selection. So in other words, what he said is that um, natural selection is one of the basic concepts um, and it's based on four uh, observations that he saw when he was traveling around the world. And these um, observations are the following. The first one is variation. And we know that variation, so we know it's when we talk about variation organisms, there's lots of different uh, organisms. So there's biodiversity um, of organisms. But there's also not only biodiversity, there is also in a population. So in one population, we also find differences. Okay, so we might see some um, organisms that have a lighter color or a darker color or taller. So in one population, there is also variety. And this is the var variation he was talking about. So not all the organisms of a population look all exactly the same. Okay, and we also learned, we know where genetic variation comes, it comes with sexual reproduction. Then, because of that variation, uh, or in that variation, within a population, there's lots of offspring that are produced. So they don't just produce uh, a few offspring, there are lots produced. And when there are lots of organisms, it's going to increase competition. And they're going to compete um, for natural resources. So they're going to then compete with each other um, for food, for space, food, water, space, even mating partners. Um, so that competition would then increase. So as they get older, they would then compete for all of those things. And then he noticed that there are different characteristics and those characteristics obviously are linked to variation. So as soon as we have variation, that means then that organisms would have these various characteristics. And we know this, we've learned about genetics, we know that there are characteristics or a gene for a characteristic may have different forms, such as blue eyes and brown eyes and green eyes and whatever. So that he noticed that. Um, and then what he noticed is that some characteristics are suitable in an environment and some characteristics are not. Right, and then the last point that, or the last observation he made, is that based on those characteristics, okay, certain organisms, or certain of the, um, well, let's call them organisms, because he looked at animals and plants, um, certain of the organisms survive, and others don't. All right, so those were his observations, and then he drew up his theory based on that. Okay, so let's have a look in a little bit more detail. Okay, so if we see, we can have a look, and this is a very nice diagram here. We can see that um, in this, this example, we're using um, butterflies, and in this population of butterflies, there's variation. Okay, so there we can see there's variation. We have yellow butterflies here, and we have brown butterflies here, um, and so there is genetic variation within the population. Okay, now when those butterfly, those butterflies as adults, when they reproduce, they produce many offspring. You can see there are many offspring that are produced, more than is uh, needed for survival of the population or the species. So we have lots and lots of offspring that are produced, and that leads to competition. Because all of those little offspring or all of those um, new generation, they, gain, they need food. They need space, they need water, they need whatever resources to be able to survive. So there will be competition for them. And then 
what happens is we see that we can see there are different characteristics in the offspring. Um, we can see here there are green and blue worms, and these ones are brown and yellow. Uh, and those are sort of maybe yellow and bluish green, and then the, the brown. And when in the natural environment, we see that it's the brown worms that seem to camouflage nicely against the tree. Whereas this greenish, bluish worm here stands out and is very conspicuous. So that predators, which are these birds, they can see those worms, uh, those offspring a lot more clearly than they can see the ones uh, that are camouflaged on the bark of the, of the tree. So those individuals then, these ones obviously don't have a favorable characteristic, whereas the ones that camouflage, well, they are able to, uh, they then have the favorable characteristic. And so they then survive um, in the environment. And what happens is they then are able to reproduce or to um, mature. And when they mature, they obviously develop into butterflies. And here you can see it's the brown butterflies that then become more dominant in the population. So over time, more and more of this uh, variety of butterfly, the brown one, that is nicely um, camouflaged in the environment, then becomes the, the dominant um, phenotype in a population. And that's how we get um, the change or natural selection taking place. Okay, so let's look at each point now in detail. All right, so how does natural selection work? Okay, let's look specifically. So we said initially, there is a great deal of variation. Okay, so there's lots of different forms or varieties in, a, in the offspring. They don't all look exactly the same. It was um, sexual reproduction in these organisms that took place. And we know as soon as sexual reproduction takes place, there's a lot of genetic variation that can, take, can happen. All right, so there's variation in the offspring. Some have a favorable characteristic and some do not. So those that, depending on the environmental conditions that we have or that those organisms live in, there are some characteristics that would be, make them better suited for those environmental conditions. And then there are those that are not so well suited and um, that is what happens in a population. All right, so here we can see our example again is we've got the yellow butterfly and the brown butterfly. So there is genetic variation within that population. All right, so when there's a change, so that's important, as soon as there's a change in the environmental conditions. So as soon as um, the, the conditions then favor a certain characteristic or one of the forms of the characteristic, it is then that, um, and there's competition for food space and those kind of things, as I said, then certain organisms will survive and others won't. All right. So here we can see there's lots of offspring um, and now there's lots of competition between all these organisms because of overproduction and that then is, now becomes competition for survival. Right, then, the organisms with the characteristics which make them more suited. So those ones that are better suited in the environment, okay, to the new environment or to the competition, um, they survive. And when they survive, obviously, they're going to then continue in their life cycle and they will then become sexually mature. And once they are sexually mature, then they can reproduce. Okay, so there we can see, then, when they reproduce, they are passing on their favorable characteristic. All right, but those organisms, so those organisms with the unfavorable characteristic, in other words, that characteristic which doesn't uh, allow them to be suited to the environment. So in our example of the worms where we had the brightly colored, greeny, yellow, blue worm, as opposed to the brown worm, and they live in trees, um, on the tree, on the stem of a tree, then that would not be suitable. 
Okay, so they then become conspicuous. They're not nicely camouflaged, so the predators, the birds can see them, and they then are easily uh, um, visible, and then the birds eat them. So they then would die off. Right, so here we can see. Already, we can see that there are more of those, those organisms with the favorable characteristic, and only a few with the unfavorable characteristic because they become very conspicuous and predators can pick them off very easily. All right, so that means that more offspring in the next generation. Okay, so now we're talking about the next generation of worms and they would have the advantageous characteristic or the favorable characteristic because in that set of circumstances or that, those environmental conditions, that then is the favorable characteristic. So now that the next generation inherits those uh, favorable characteristics from the, the parents and these differences then accumulate. Okay, so as each generation goes on, because there are more and more um, or, uh, offspring in a population with that specific characteristic that are able to survive um, and they then reproduce and they would pass on that characteristic. So eventually all the individuals in a population will have the new characteristic or trait. And that is how natural selection takes place. Right, so there we can see in our diagram very nicely we can see that we have more of the brown butterflies um, than the yellow and blue butterfly. All right, so, and eventually, that yellow, uh, there might come a time when there are no more of the yellow uh, variation in a population. And if um, somebody had to ask, um, what does the population, or what, the, what does it look like? What does the butterfly look like? People might say they're brown. And then um, conditions might change. And in a couple of years, we find we've got actually yellow butterflies. And that's because the, the conditions have now changed and the characteristic for yellow actually became the favorable again. So natural selection works in where the environment um, provides the selective pressure uh, for a specific characteristic to either be favorable or unfavorable. And if it's favorable, it would be selected for and if it's unfavorable, it's selected against, and those organisms then would die out in those specific environmental conditions. Okay, so to quickly sum up Darwin's theory of natural selection, we know in his four observations that there was variation in, in um, a population. This led to competition. There were certain characteristics that were favorable and unfavorable, and then the favorable characteristic would be selected. And that is how natural selection works. Okay, so let's take a break. Um, see if you can stretch your legs and get something to drink, and we'll see you after the break. Welcome back from the break. Let's carry on with our lesson. Okay, so we were looking at the theories of evolution. We've had a look at Lamarck. We've had a look at Darwin. And now we're going to have a look at punctuated equilibrium. And we're going to have a look at artificial selection. All right, so we're first going to compare the differences between Lamarck or Lamarckism and Darwinism, and it's very important that we do know the difference. So the first difference we're going to have a look at is the makeup of a population. And um, a population in, in Lamarck's theory, or under Lamarck's theory, he believed um, that they were all, all the organisms were the same. So they were all born with exactly the same characteristic, and there was no variation. Whereas if we have a look at Darwin's theory, we see that members have similar characteristics, but there is variation amongst the, the offspring. All right, and then in the second difference, we have a look at how the population changed 
or um, the species change. So it was the transformation of the population. So under Lamarck's theory, he believed, or he said, that individuals are able to transform during a lifetime. Okay, so they would then develop a characteristic, and once they had acquired that characteristic, they would then be able to, in their lifetime, pass it on to the next generation. Whereas Darwinism states that the population transforms and not individuals. That's very important. So we need to remember that it's not individuals, but population. Because remember, we can't change our genetics. So once an individual's genetics uh, is established, then we, it cannot be changed. So that has to do with genetics. Okay. And it's the population that transforms over time. And as I said, it's only through genetic means. All right, and then the last, uh, or the, the third point of the difference between Lamarck and Darwin is the mechanism of change. Okay, so if we have a look at Lamarck's theory, he said that individuals choose which traits to pass on to their offspring. And those changes then are directed to meet survival. So in other words, the organism decides, for example, the giraffes, it's the long neck that they would like to pass on to their offspring because they are then able to feed off the tall um, trees. Whereas in Darwinism, um, the environment exercises selective pressure. And remember when I went through uh, Darwinism, we said that it's nature or the environment that brings about the, the factors that select. And that causes change um, of in, in the population. So there is variation that exists, okay? And, and that happens because, because of genetics and because of mutations. So not all offspring. And because most organisms, um, most organisms reproduce sexually, and that is why we have genetic variation. So with the formation of the gametes, as well as the uh, uh, fertilization and random mating, we end up that there will always be variation in a population. All right, so now we're going to have a look at another theory um, or another model of um, evolution, and that is called punctuated equilibrium. And earlier I said, let's have a look. So punctuated means that there are breaks or gaps in, uh, in something, and then equilibrium is um, sort of stasis. Okay, so if we have a look at this theory, it was first put forward by two scientists, Aldridge and Gould, and you can see it was more recently formulated. It was formulated in 1972, and they had the, um, the benefit of the fossil record. So what they did is they studied the fossil record and what they observed is that um, the fossil record gave them a very different picture of evolution. So Darwin and other theories and theories before that we called gradualism. So what happened is organisms slowly changed over time. And we call that theory gradualism. And they were now offering a theory that was um, different or a, a different, uh, an opposite explanation. Okay, so they believed that the fossil record, so they said no when they studied the fossil record, it didn't, it did not support the theory of gradual evolution. But rather that there were long periods of time where there was stasis. So in other words, nothing changed. Okay, so the organisms remained more or less the same um, for long periods of time. And this then uh, would then be punctuated. So there was very little evolutionary change during that time. And then occasional rapid formation of new species. So it would be a much shorter period of time. Because here you can see it's the, the long periods of 4 to 10 million years, whereas in very short 
between 5,000 and 50,000 years, there would be rapid change in species. So let's have a look at a diagram. Okay, so here we can see the first diagram at the top, this one here. Um, it shows us a change in birds, you can see specifically in the beak of the birds. And as time goes by, you can see here's time as it goes past, so the beaks gradually change until they are what they are at the end. Where, so that was an example, or this is an example of gradualism. And according to um, the punctuated equilibrium, they say, no, this isn't the way what the fossil record tells us. The fossil record shows us that um, here we have an organism, and you can see, or the bird, and you can see its beak. And then we have a very short period. Yeah, you can see there's a very short period of time where there was rapid change. So the beaks went from that to this, um, where they have changed quite rapidly. And, and then there's long periods of time where there's very little change again, and then we're going to find uh, rapid periods of change again. All right, so this one is gradualism, and then this one obviously would be of punctuated equilibrium. Okay, that's all we have time for today. See you next time. Oh, 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 oh,